It's a great pleasure, a really great pleasure to introduce Ted Starner from Georgia Tech visiting us here in the wonderful Bay Area. Um, Told us all the sunlight today. It's really bright and nice and warm. <laughs> uh, Ted has got his uh, PhD from MIT and then moved on to Georgia Tech and is possibly the person that defined uh, the use of variable computers in a productive life. Uh, there's a number of people who started running around with little displays, but his work is much deeper, much more interesting than most of the other people. Um, he's been working on various interfaces since, um, input devices, uh, variable display devices, and so on. And it's a real pleasure having him talk about his most recent research. So with that, he's also a friend of Sergey Brin, I take it? But uh, we Sergey's... each other from, we ran to each other at conferences. But he's back. out of town today, unfortunately, so he can't make it here. Well, looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. OK, let me first apologize, because um, I literally got off a plane um, recently uh, this morning and drove down here. The uh, weather in Atlanta, we're having high storms, had a, it looked like a tornado coming in, but um, uh, didn't show up. But it meant that all the planes got messed up. And I spent the night in the airport. So if I seem a little out of it, that's why. Uh, we're also going to be fl uh, switching back and forth between different uh, devices here. So. Um, Bear with the, me and the video folks as we go between, uh, uh, between systems. OK. So last time I was here, I talked about um, how to improve mini QWERTY keyboards, how to uh, do a lot of stuff with mobile computers, a lot of mobile HCI stuff. Uh, today, uh, if you sell that talk, you won't be bored, because today is almost completely different. Uh, let me start out with something that shouldn't work. This is something called the mobile music touch. Let me tell you what it does. Uh, with this device, you can actually learn piano melodies without paying attention to it. In other words, you can be wearing this glove right here and be learning how to play, I don't know, Star Spangled Banner. Um, now, how this works is that you have a mobile phone. In this case, it's the open mocha you see on the screen there. And this, uh, you upload your songs to, and the MIDI player in the phone plays the songs in, sorry, that's actually coming online. Uh, it plays the songs over and over again in your Bluetooth headset or your earphones, whatever you have on. But for each note, it actually taps the finger responsible for that note uh, using this glove. Now, this is a Bluetooth glove. Um, the, uh, there's vibrators in each finger, which you can see there. And they're on the knuckles. They're tuned to 160 hertz, which is about the frequency you're Pacinian corpuscles are most sensitive to. The fingers, the whole finger vibrates, and so you get an idea of which finger goes with which note. Now, I'm going to pass this around as I talk about this so people can actually play with it. Uh, so there is a toggle switch in the back. Um, toggle it from off to on, and you'll feel it start up. I think it's right now doing the sequence of dashing through the snow. Um, so feel free to. Feel free to play with this, and, and then uh, I'll tell you why this particular glove is so interesting in just a little bit. No, you don't want me to sing. <laughs> this is not karaoke night. Um, <laughs> the uh, inside the box there, we've made many different versions of this of this uh, glove, but uh, it's pretty simple. It's just a Bluetooth receiver you can see in the center there attached to a glove. We've learned a lot about sewing wires into gloves. Uh, Sebastian, you got it working? Yeah. Yeah, cool. It sounds great. It sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> well, you really have to have the music with it, right? Um, but uh, you might say, you might wonder why this works, right? In particular, uh, we'll talk about the hands moving left and right in the piano a little bit. Let me describe to you a, a, the simple study we did first, which is we did uh, two newly composed 10-note passages. Now, we did newly composed because the first study we did, we used Amazing Grace and the dashing through the snow part of Jingle Bells. And some of our subjects were from Muslim countries and had heard neither of them. Um, and some of our subjects, of course, they were very, very familiar. None of our subjects knew how to play piano or had a musical background. but. Um, uh, we wanted to have something that we had as clean as a, a study as we could get. So we actually showed, uh, we gathered 16 subjects, none of them have musical experience. We showed them 
the passage once on a keyboard where the keys light up, and then they had to try to repeat it. And that was the base case. Then for the next 30 minutes, they did a reading comprehension exam. And that reading comprehension exam was what you find on normal SAT. Matter of fact, I think I have it here. I don't know if you can see that. But it's something where they have to read the paragraph and answer questions. And we'll come back to that in a second. And after 30 minutes of doing this, uh, they have the glove, seeing they're playing the passage in their earpiece, in their headphones, as well as tapping their fingers. That's the experimental condition. The control condition was just playing the audio in their headphones over and over again. Um, after 30 minutes, each subject tries to play the song again. Um, and this is a within subject study, a two by two design. Uh, and this was presented at CHI this year, so if people are interested in the details, you can look at it there. Again, here was the distractor task. We actually tested people on the distractor task. Uh, their scores did not improve or, di or did not change in the experimental condition versus the control condition. And this is the total number of errors after 30 minutes. Now, the green bars are kind of, kind of fluorescent green on the, on the screen here. Um, show the number of errors made by people in the experimental condition. The red shows the number of errors they made when they just had the audio playing. As you can see here, they don't learn anything with just the audio playing. But most of them, half of them, play the sequence correctly with no mistakes uh, the, after the 30 minutes of passive practice. Now, this is really kind of bizarre. I mean, how many people would have thought that would have worked? Right? I certainly didn't. Um, so this, this, this is the type of thing that as a cognitive science major, um, I go, how's this working? So we've done the study again and again and again in two different continents uh, with three different researchers. And it seems to hold true. And it seems to work no matter if the distraction task is a reading comprehension task, if you're reading your email, if you're watching a movie, if you're doing a scavenger hunt, if you're playing a memory game, or even at Kai, I gave a talk and had the system teach me Beethoven's Ode to Joy uh, as I was giving the talk. Which let me tell you, talk about performance pressure. I just said about how this thing works, and I had to walk up to the keyboard and try it. I didn't even know where to put my hand down at first. But indeed, I can now play Beethoven's Ode to Joy, at least the first two passages. Uh, the first two, first two phrases are uh, pretty flawless, flawless three. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't watch video of myself giving the talk. I will tell you that having the audio, I, the, th the thing's volume was too loud, so it was really distracting. <laughs> um, but you can imagine if you're doing things like email or something where it's more quiet, it might not be so distracting. One of the things we want to do right now is we're really curious to see if the audio is necessary. And maybe just the, the tapping of the fingers is necessary to give you this sort of muscle memory. Um, now. Some of you actually play piano might say, hey, how about the left and right movements of the hands? Well, actually, this technique is better for things like clarinet or saxophone or flute, something where you're not moving the hands around a lot. But what we found is that when we did you know, real piano pieces, and this is still just one-handed, where you're moving around, you have somebody work on um, a song until they can play through it once. And then you turn on the glove and let them spend the, next, the rest of the day feeling it on their hand. And they actually continue to learn uh, instead of forget. So you don't. So it's sort of passive haptic rehearsal at that point. One of our reviewers in one of our papers actually said they really liked it because for musicians with repetitive stress injuries, they could actually practice without practicing, which is kind of cool. Um, the other thing we're kind of interested is in is uh, will this work for other manual learning tasks, things like typing or sign language or prosthetics or complicated manual controls. We don't know yet. This whole idea of passive haptic learning, as we call it, is new. And we're very excited about it, but we don't know how far it's going to go. go, to go, going to go. One of the things we do have data on, though, is passive haptic rehabilitation. We work with the Shepherd Spinal Cord Center in Atlanta. It's one of the nation's premier uh, centers for dealing with traumatic spinal cord injury. And uh, in particular, we're working with the murder ball team, uh, who you can see a picture of them here. Um, and what, uh, we had a pilot study where we showed that wearing this glove and actually having this vibration seems to improve uh, these folks' ability to grasp objects and manipulate them, able to, ability to feel 
uh, objects on their fingers, and most importantly, ability to do things for themselves, like uh, uh, butting their own shirt. And you know, we only ran this with two subjects so far. We're gearing up for a full-scale study. But there's stuff in the literature that seems to indicate that having this passive tapping on your fingers actually activates the, the motor region as well as the somatosensory region. And this passive practice may actually help neurons uh, reconfigure and rehook up. Um, and I can give people references for that if they're interested. Uh, but we're trying to uh, get this actually uh, hooked up this summer and fall uh, with a more large-scale study and show and see if there really is an effect here. Um, that's one of the reasons why we're interested in whether or not the audio is necessary. If the audio is not necessary, it could be very, very useful. Okay, any questions on that before I move on? I'll try and make this interactive. Okay, I have a lot of stuff here, way too much stuff, so you know, we're not going to get through it all. Ask away. Um, so as some of you know, I've been wearing computers for 17 years now. Uh, I have a heads-up display on. I use a keyboard called Twiddler. And in fact, right now I'm looking at my notes for this talk in my eyepiece. And we've learned a lot about mobile devices uh, since then. One of the biggest things is access time is a killer. Uh, access time is the amount of time it takes you to physically get the phone out of your pocket, get on, get to the right place in the interface. And I'm actually doing this right now. Uh, so I'm getting to my calendar, and you can see that that took me, you know, and I'm practiced at this, that took me about 15 seconds. On average, it's about 20 seconds to get to an application on your phone. Wow. It, it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Windows, Windows uh, is going to be a serious problem in a phone. What we found out is that any time you have, it takes more than two seconds to get access to your interface, your use of it tends to go off exponentially. So if you can make it a quick interaction, people will do it all the time. If it takes more than two seconds, uh, the, the usage of it goes down linearly or exponentially depending on the type of interface. Now the other thing that we've discovered is that people don't really multitask, they multiplex for most things. I just talked to you about a real, as far as I know, a real multitasking application, but most of the time when people are driving and texting, they either are driving or texting, they're switching back and forth fast or not, as the case may be. Um, by the way, uh, we've been doing some own studies on driving, texting while driving. It's really, really bad. There is one obstacle on our course. The course is 28 feet away from it. It's a telephone pole. And this, the uh, drivers still scare us to death uh, driving this car. We're actually using um, the uh, Thomas, or using uh, 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 the, the Georgia Tech's or Thomas car for this. <laughs> Little you know, it's because of my subjects. No, uh, <laughs> um, yep. Um, but one of the things we've discovered is that when people are actually using an interface, like say walking down the street, if you're walking down the street and you know out late night in, in uh, Palo Alto, you're going to get some ice cream or something, you'll spend uh, on average about four seconds on your phone interface before looking up to see where you're going and looking back down at your display, and. Uh, that kind of leads to the four-second rule. Um, if you can actually make your interface happen in four seconds, it'll be much more useful to people. In other words, if you can get a little bit of useful work done before you have to look back up again, if you can checkpoint, it's actually going to be much more useful than if you can't. And that's how, we're, and that's why we're making this uh, distinction on micro interactions. Micro interactions are fast to access and allow them to find checkpointing. Now, if you're on something like a bus or a subway you might actually go uh, spend more time on your interface. But I'm talking about the, the four seconds seems to be a nice rule for making something that's universally applicable. Now, when I say, when I say that, let me give you an example. Checking your time on your watch, if you actually wear a wristwatch, is a relatively fast interaction. It takes less than two seconds to do the entire interaction. It's very valuable, it's fast to access, and it gives you feedback. Now, you notice that a lot of people now are, are putting their time on, on their cell phone, right? Oops, there we go. Not quite so fast to access, but the cell phone is a, a useful enough device that people are willing to take that hit. Wristwatches actually came into existence during, or into popular use in World War I when you had to time your trench warfare, right? When people had to 
uh, go over the trench line all at the same time. And you can't be sitting there filling with your pocket watch when you're about ready to go, you know, run against the Germans. So uh, that was one thing that made all the GIs back then uh, wear wristwatches. But also aviators. You can't be flying your plane and be fooling around with your pocket watch. You need something where you can look at quickly and get back to what you're doing. And back then, World War I, you actually had to fly by your clock. Now, so pocket watches went the way of the dodo. Now they've come back, right? They're cell phones. But I think what we're going to see is a lot more use of very fast access interfaces. Now, one of the things we're doing that for that is something called uh, textile interfaces. Now, we're trying to create interfaces that can be woven into your clothing. And I really mean woven or, knit or embroidered in this case, into your clothing. And we're using embroidery because it's a raised thread. You can actually feel it. So if I was going to control my iPod uh, with something that was on my sleeve, I can feel the controls here. I can grope for them, we'll call gro good gropeability, um, and actually uh, interact with it without looking, so there's no visual distraction. Now, there's been a lot of work done by this by some friends of mine, Maggie Orth and Remy Post, back in the mid-90s. But what we've decided to do is start taking a look at this from um, a more um, complete uh, uh, interaction as far as trying to actually reproduce the GUI toolkit from scratch uh, on uh, using these devices. Now, a way to actually have demonstrations of different circuits that people can use uh, in the fashion industry. Now, this is a book, and I have a live version of this. This machine is hooked up to do, uh, show you this afterwards, to show these different types of interfaces. This is what's called a knife edge pleat. It's got three lines in it, one on each side of the pleat and one on the base. And depending on which way the person strokes the pleat, it uh, moves the slider one way or the other. So you can imagine that if you have this embroidered on your pants leg, for example, you could use this to control uh, a web page in your, in your heads-up display or you need know, to slide up and down, or you can imagine controlling the volume of your uh, MP3 player. Here is a menu uh, widget rendered in embroidery. So you can see we have three uh, menus, or three uh, categories like you know, file, edit, select, like you might have on a Mac. And then you have five options. And so I'm actually controlling the graphics here on the right-hand side uh, based on which line I touch. Now again, imagine this is not in the book, but on a piece of clothing, like on your armband, or on your arm, so that you can actually you know, select different menus on your iPhone or your, on your uh, G phone or whatever else you want to think about. <coughs> this is something called the rocker switch. This is a multi-touch system, not just like the last one, though. Uh, so you remember the old types of rocker switches where you can rotate, you can pivot about a point, and one that goes turns the volume down, one turns the volume up. Well, this has three different pivot, pivot points. So you have three different sliders you can access. And then you just, once you select one, you just pivot about it, hit the two bigger circles, and that adjusts the uh, level on each slider. Now, for those of you who are electrical engineering types uh, in the crowd, um, I can give you a, a quick lesson of how the circuitry is done. It's, this is not the normal capacitive sensor you might normal, think it is, uh, because the problem with fabric is that as it crinkles and wrinkles, uh, it gets out of calibration real quickly. This is actually recalibrating itself you know, every time it senses, which is really kind of cool. Here's a zipper. This, is, uh, this has been done before. We're doing it, I think, a slightly different way. It can sense its position. Jimmy? Uh, nothing. It's all uh, conductive embroidery. It's, it's silver uh, thread, so it washes just fine. The, all the lines are conductive thread. The only thing you got to do is take out the circuitry where it combines in. Yeah? It will, they will sense fa falsely in that case, yeah. But there's, ways, there's ways to do it where you do a, a re basically a, a Wheatstone bridge, and you can do a little bit better than what we're doing here. Uh, this is a proximity sensor. This is <laughs> that one of the first things we did. The, the brother's embroidery machine we have, one of its default uh, settings is to embroider Hello Kitty. So we have <coughs> the Hello Kitty um, uh, proximity sensor here. And you can see, depending on how close you get, um, 
it has different sensitivity light ranges. It's it's the uh, the brightness of the rectangle indicates how close you are to the system. <coughs> this is a really complicated one. Uh, with this, by stroking the by hitting the the top. Uh, pad and one of the three but middle buttons. You select one of the three sliders on the top. By hitting the bottom pad and one of the middle three sliders, uh, three buttons, you get the three sliders on the bottom. And then you can increase and decrease it by doing gestures on top of it. Now, unfortunately, this one's not tuned very well when we did the video, but you get the idea. Okay. <coughs> so if we can switch back to the uh, having both screens be the presentation. I appreciate it. That way I can cheat by keeping on looking at my notes. Okay. So these conductive embroidery really got us thinking about all sorts of things we could do with conductive embroidery. Let me do this. Um, so it's not quite so distracting. Um, we now have a way to do input. We need to do output as well. Remember, what we're trying to do is make something here where you can interact with an object. Uh, you can get access to the interface in two seconds or less, and you can do the whole interaction in four seconds or less. So uh, we got some output. Sorry, some input. How about some output? Well, these are conductive threads. They have a high impedance, relatively speaking, compared to a normal wire, but at high voltage, it doesn't matter. The human body senses uh, a voltage uh, current tuned to the exact right uh, level um, as vibration. So what we start looking at is can we make a wristwatch watch band that shocks you in different patterns? It feels like vibration to you, but we're trying to figure out how many different patterns we can indicate. So you can imagine that you have an SMS or a call coming in. You can have a different, not ringtones, but shock tones, vibrations, you know, good sensations, I don't know, uh, uh, coming in through this wristband. And I have a copy of that up here somewhere I can show you, show you all. Uh, and so we, this is done by Sung Young Lee, who just got her, just defend her PhD. Uh, it turned out that this was much higher resolution than the human wrist can feel. Believe it or not, if you take two points and put them close together on your wrist, you really can't determine it's two points. Most times you think it's just one. And believe it or not, you have to get out to like a centimeter before you start distinguishing that there are two points. On your fingertip, it's like two millimeters. But on your wrist, it's a centimeter, sometimes more. It's really ridiculous. Excuse me? Well, if you, uh, so if you start using time delay, you, you can do a completely different pattern. We're looking at spatial stuff here, but you can do all sorts of stuff with time. Um, and matter of fact, that's what the next slide is going to be about. <laughs> You're predicting me. Um, but uh, what's also very interesting is that uh, while you can actually sense, well, you can actually tune the system to do decent shock levels on the fingertip, on your wrist, uh, your wrist is often dry or wet. And so the amount of current you need is very different from minute to minute. So my poor grad student ended up having a little tattoo. No, uh, <laughs> it, it, it was a very fine threshold between pain and the vibration sensation we wanted. Uh, so we actually had to go away from this to a vibration pattern. However, now we're going back to it. I said that we could sense capacitance um, and resistance using these threads. So here's an idea. Let's sense the water content of your skin and then dial up or down the current depending on how much you need to get the right vibration feel. And so we have a circuit in our lab right now that does that. It's very crude, but it's getting there. And so we're going to revisit this very soon. Um, other people have done this sort of thing on the forehead or on the tongue. Turns out the tongue's a very good place for it because it's always wet. It takes very little current to get a good sensation there. And your tongue has got a high density of uh, receptors. Um, your wrist is relatively insensate, uh, but it's a really good place for thinking about wristwatches. So we want to keep on going down this wristwatch form factor. <coughs> And uh, we decided to make a display that was just three vibrators. Now, these vibrators are made so that two of them hit your wrist bones at the top, just where, just where your arm bone hits your wrist. There's two bones there. We're generally doing this on the bottom side of your wrist. And there's one 
uh, in the middle, but back going up your arm a little bit. And we can actually do 24 different patterns here. The patterns differ depending on which vibrator, vibrator starts the pattern, one, two, or three. And you can see that in the red, green, and blue columns. It also is the, we have different intensities of the patterns, low and high. We have uh, what's, ca what's pul called pulsed intensities, so that the vibrator is going zzz, 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 versus zzz, zzz, zzz. And let's see here, we didn't have frequency. Oh, I think we have different frequencies as well. So 24 patterns total, and we're trying to see how well can people actually sense these 24 different patterns on the, on the wrist. And the answer is not bad, except for intensity. It turns out intensity is a very, very poor thing for actually getting, transferring information from, uh, or information over your wristwatch. So again, our idea here is to transfer messages, alerts, like who's sending you an SMS, which sort of phone call is coming in, to this sort of wristwatch. And we'll talk more about wristwatch if people are interested, I can talk more about wristwatches, which wristwatch interfaces afterwards. What's interesting here is that intensity is a, re is a really horrible feature to use, so we got rid of it. Direction was pretty good, temporal pattern was pretty good, starting point was very good. So if you're going to actually make a wristwatch with vibrators in it, you know, here's a good starting point. Next thing is, can we actually use these vibrators while you're doing other things? Now remember what I said about people don't actually multitask, they more multiplex. So what we did is we compared uh, using one of these, one of these uh, wearable tactile displays to a normal phone. So normally if somebody's SMSing you, uh, you reach in your pocket and you pull out a device and you look at the, the, see who's calling or what the SMS is and you put it back in your pocket. So we made a, a system where people had to pull out their phone and hit one of these three buttons on this keypad uh, to complete the trial. With, uh, with a vibrator system, they had to do one of three different patterns. Now, we're trying to do something that sort of mimics the high visual intensity, the high visual distraction of driving. And for that, we have this. Uh, so they have five seconds to determine whether or not the number 51 is in this image. Now, I know all of you, being nerds, are not going to listen to me for the next uh, 20 seconds as you're trying to figure out if 51 is in there. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> Give it up. Um, but the point is, you can't help but paying attention to it, right? So we're doing this on Georgia Tech, Georgia Tech students. It's a very good distractor task. Um, so uh, uh, it worked very well to kind of emulate visual, high visual distraction while getting these different alerts. The Buzzware system is actually doing these, these three different patterns. They are the most distinctive patterns we had. And we're looking at information transfer. Now notice, ignore the, ignore the outlier on the right-hand side for a second. We have different pri difficulty primary tasks. One where, is where there's only 10 numbers on the screen, you gotta find 51, 51 is in those 10 numbers. One's when there's 30 numbers, one when there's 50 numbers. Right, so that's the, the easy, moderate, and difficult. Notice that the bits we can transfer per second, or per minute in this case, is actually uh, uh, higher with the tactile display than it is with the phone. Interestingly, also, the tactile display does not interfere with your primary task, um, which is great. But let's look at the, the left-hand side here. The phone is having a much higher bit transfer rate when you're just paying attention to the phone than when you're just paying attention to the wearable tactile display. Why is that? Well, it's something called the yerksey dodson law. People get bored when you only give them, give them one task at a time and their mind wanders, and because the, the tact, we think, because the tactile display is so easy, they are off doing something else in their own minds and don't pay attention to the study anymore. And so that's why we think we have this, this discrepancy on the left-hand side. Uh, with the phone, it's still a physically active enough thing that people are forced to pay attention to it. But what we're most interested in is this, this, this uh, uh, multiplexing uh, scenario, like when you're driving and you're getting an SMS at the same time. Now, so we've talked a little bit about how we can actually do input using uh, textile interfaces, how we can actually do output using vibration and electrostimulation, um, but can we do something more complex? One of the things that we specialize in is gesture recognition. And you can imagine that if you eventually have an MP3 player that's basically, you know, looks like a hearing aid. You know, it can fit in your ear. The only problem is you don't have any buttons. 
You know, to stand to, to to be walking down the street doing this, right, is kind of socially inappropriate. Um, so can we actually make a device where you can control an MP3 player in your ear uh, when it's not big enough for buttons? Well, again, we're looking at the wristwatch. Uh, in particular, we're looking at accelerometers in the wristwatch, and we're trying to figure out can we make gestures that are distinct in <coughs> in real life to control things. Now, making gestures for controlling applications is difficult. For example, suppose I make a gesture like this for a delete email. Well, then I'm in the middle of a conversation, and I make the same gesture, and I accidentally delete all my email. That's not going to fly. And matter of fact, you guys are all familiar with this particular problem. Now, it's not particularly gesture recognition, but when you have your phone in your pocket, you know, how many of you has, have, some, have somebody call you back and say, hey, your phone called me, what did you want? I couldn't hear anything, right? I occasionally get voice messages from other people where it's just the background noise. Their butt called me. <laughs> um, no drunk dialing, no sitting and, and dialing at the same time, yeah. So there's other places where you get these sorts of problems, and people go through a lot of pain to avoid this. For example, in speech recognition, they always have a push-to-talk interface. Even when they don't do that, they do something like computer open file, something to tell the computer to listen in. On the Nintendo Wii, when you're playing bowling, which is a relatively complex gesture, right? It's doing relatively fine sensing. Um, it is, <coughs> excuse me, it is uh, requesting that you actually push a button and hold it down to do the gesture and release. That's how it's, de it's uh, uh, detecting when the uh, action is happening. On the iPhone, right, there's, you push something down and you do a slide across the interface to activate the phone. And most phones, uh, including, I have a backflip on me here. Aha. Uh, has the same sort of thing. It has a push button and then, oops. And then you have to hit another button for it to actually work. And I need to pull this out anyways in just a second. So I might as well get it out. Um, so what we're trying to do is make a system where you don't need these push to activate. It'd be much cooler if I actually had a system where I just made the gesture and it did the action. If I actually had to have a button in my wristwatch to activate the wristwatch and then do the gesture, it kind of misses the point. Why would I do that anyways? I should just have a button, right? Anything that requires too much attention to push a button is probably the wrong thing. Um, now, correspondingly, you can imagine I have uh, an accelerometer in my MP3 player here, and my gesture for change track is that. But um, <laughs> that. Um, but then you start looking at like Night in the Roxbury as you change tracks. Um, it's a distinctive gesture, by the way. You can do it. I just don't necessarily recommend it. Um, but what we want to do now is actually make uh, a device, such a, a, a toolkit, so that people can, can research these gestures easily. And what normally happens is people do some survey. Like, suppose we're trying to make a gesture system for the, the iPod. Um, people would say, so what gesture do you need for play? Somebody give me a gesture for play. What gesture do you want? You have a wristwatch on. What gesture do you want for, for play? This? OK. What else? This? This? OK, anything else? OK, notice I didn't get any, any similar ones yet. Everybody has their own gesture. Um, <coughs> so usually people go off and do a lot of surveys and try to figure out what's, <laughs> yeah, there we go, uh, figure out what sort of gesture people want. And then they try to make a gesture recognition system for it. And then they, um, have that system in an actual device, and they find out it doesn't work at all, right? Because it's, it's false triggering all over the place. So that's where uh, magic comes in, the mobile action gesture interface creation tool. So we're using an accelerometer on the wrist again, just uh, to start out with. Uh, for those of you who do machine learning and pattern recognition in the, in the uh, crowd, you can think of this as simple dynamic time warp, warp, uh, warping just because it's the easiest to explain. For those of you who aren't machine uh, learning or pattern recognition people, basically, if you have one gesture that's sort of the one you want to recognize, uh, and you have templates of other gestures that are the 
one that indicates you know, the play function. You compare the, the red to the green by drawing lines to the closest thing, the closest, closest points on each. And then the difference between the, the mouse slant on those lines is uh, the error. Now, for those of you who are pattern rec people, what we're actually doing is ISACs. Um, it allows us to search very large databases um, in split seconds. Um, and so we can actually make a user interface that just flies. Uh, like I said, the design process in the past is basically people try to create a gesture system, then they try to test it in the real world. They find most of those gestures to conflict with real world gestures, that, and they go back to the drawing board. What magic allows you to do <coughs> is do them both at the same time. Test your gestures against each other and against the real world. Now, how does that work? What we do is we collect so something called the Everyday Gesture Library. Now, we put the sensor you want to use for your iPod on your wrist, and we give it to somebody for, to wear for a month. And we try to get you know, representative actions and representative people. So we might get an academic, a librarian, a construction worker, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, a, um, uh, a pet sitter, you know, just try to span the space that people might use this device. And we gather lots of data from their everyday life. We also, if they'll put up with it, get video from this cap this fashionable cap um, with a, uh, a fisheye lens on. Now notice that fisheye lens is extreme enough that you really have to get within kissing distance of somebody to actually recognize who they are in the video image. So it's actually privacy preserving. Um, and so when uh, we, so we have a whole huge library of people's everyday gestures and video of what they were doing when that motion occurred. So then, if you have a candidate gesture you want to try, say, you know, this or this or this or whatever everybody was uh, uh, telling me, you can actually try that against everybody's months of data and see which ones work and which ones don't. And this is the interface for it. Um, so I am, um, <coughs> oh, I could probably do this as a cursor here. Yeah, here we go. So let's first look at this. This, this for the pattern recognition people, is uh, this is each of the classes. So we have four different gestures we're looking at here. Of each of the four gestures, we're looking at the inter, intra class uh, uh, variants versus the closeness of all other classes and their variants as related to that gesture. So this is both intra and inter class variants. Um, over here, hey, don't do that. Over here, it's a bomb. That is our month of data. And you probably can't see it back there, but there's little yellow, uh, pink or yellow lines for each gesture as it happened in, in the month-long data. And so then you can click on one of those, uh, as we see here, and it shows you that particular example of when that happened in, person's everyday, in people's everyday lives and what they were doing at that time in the video. It also gives you some idea about uh, these different examples of class, of, of of gestures, we're doing a K nearest neighbors approach here, um, and some other details that, um, if you are a panoramic person, you can tune. Now we had a lot of fun with this. Uh, we actually had people try and make eight control gestures for the new UPod Touchless by Pair Computer, um, and people who had the EGL uh, would generally have about two false positives per gesture per hour, as people without the EGL had 50 false positives. Now, this, it didn't matter if they claimed to know pattern recognition or not. They all sucked. They were all very bad at this, bad at this task. So um, the EGL really, having this database really had a big, uh, uh, a big impact on the system. Now, the other thing that was kind of cool about this is that our uh, subjects really did uh, discover ways to um, improve uh, their performance by doing particular techniques uh, to get better gesture recognition. And I will switch to a file to show you these. So this is somebody doing iconic gesture. In other words, they'll repeat each of these two times so you can see it. Uh, the first one was iconic and, and stop. The second one was really in interesting is impacts. In other words, when you hit your hand against the other hand, that looks very distinct in the accelerometer in the accelerometer space compared to your everyday actions. This guy is prefixing every gesture he has with another gesture. So his 
is the way to, is basically saying, you know, listen to me, computer, and then he does this. Um, let's see, what's this one? This other one is just repeating the same gesture twice. So you get some idea of the, the types of gestures you need to get uniqueness. Now the problem is a lot of these things are not socially appropriate, right? The, you know, the guy who's doing, computer, listen to me, okay, I really mean it, now, this and this. That, if you saw me doing that walking down the street, you'd probably think I'm an idiot. Either that or some mage who's doing incantations. Um, but if you saw me doing something like, you know, this, where I'm just flicking my fingers, I can do that on my side, I can do it straight up. That is something that you could just, you know, it's a subtle gesture, you might not even notice me doing it. And it's very distinct in the database. So we're actually discovering the gestures you can make that are very subtle for controlling your mobile electronics. Now, the last video here is, is just for fun. This is somebody's uh, everyday gesture library. I think this was going on a hike somewhere. After a while, you forget you have a camera on, so you know, I'm not going to try to show you the embarrassing EGLs, but <coughs> you get the idea. And so, uh, again, this is a video you get if you found a conflict. Now, for those of you with Android phones, how many of you got a phone on you? Can you accept uh, Android phones? Can you accept uh, un... If you have the backflip, you can't have unsecured apps. But I'm going to show you a, an app right now. What we have is an application you can run on your Android phone. It uses the accelerometers in the phone. You can actually... We have a database of somebody walking around with a phone uh, in their daily life. And now you can actually make different gestures. And you can add them to the database that's there. You can see how unique they are compared to the everyday gesture library of an Android phone. And so you can start thinking about actually having different gestures for your Android phone to tie to different activities. As a matter of fact, you can even download the source code for a recognizer that will recognize the gestures you trained up. Um, so people who have the application can uh, come up afterwards and I'll share that to you. Okay. Um, one of the kind of interesting things about all this is that uh, the people who are in our user study kind of feared the EGL. They thought it was very hard, uh, which is understandable. Um, and uh, they didn't really care about the video that was there. They just cared about they had a conflict. But uh, they actually found the system uh, very useful in, in doing the task. Okay. Now I'm going to switch to something a little bit different here. This uh, is our probably our prime example of doing gesture recognition technology. This is Copycat. Let me give some background on, on Copycat. 95% of uh, deaf children are born to hearing parents. Uh, many of those parents, when their child is born, of course, do not know sign language. And since sign language, American Sign Language, is as difficult to learn as Japanese, many of them will never learn it sufficiently to really communicate with their children. And that might seem odd, but when you are working two jobs, you have three children, one of whom is deaf, um, and there's a lot of people who, in the literature, uh, who say that you know if you teach somebody two languages, they won't learn English. If you teach them sign language, they won't learn English. Uh, it turns out it's exactly the opposite way. You should teach them sign language first. And they have a much better chance of learning English. But uh, what we discovered in the, in the literature, in the, in the research, is that these children actually, uh, unless they learn some language in the age between zero and three, they will not form their short-term memory normally. And let me make that clear. So each of us can actually remember about seven things in our head. If I give you a telephone number like 2445156, you will be able to uh, repeat that phone number back to me. The children I work with often have a short-term memory of two items. Right. Um, and that happens because they do not learn a language. When you learn a language, that's when your, your, your brain is forced to form this short-term memory. Um, and so children need access to some language, any language, in order to actually form the short-term memory. So the question is, how can we make a, how can we use this gesture recognition technology we have to um, actually encourage uh, the formation of, of short-term memory and uh, 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 acquisition of language. So what we've been what we've been creating is uh, this 
system here. This is called Copycat. So what happens is uh, the hero of the game, Iris the cat here, you can see her in the bottom left-hand side here, right where E is. Iris is a white cat with blue eyes, because white cats with blue eyes are often deaf. She's the hero. She is trying to uh, find all the gems that have been stolen. And they've been stolen by snakes and spiders and alligators and all sorts of other monsters. And so the children have to, when they come upon a scene like this, they have to say that the snake is under the chair. That's the three-word phrase. Um, oftentimes, there'll be multiple chairs and multiple snakes. You've got to say which one has the gem. So that case would be the, the orange snake is under, uh, in this case, the blue chair. If they get it correct, Iris will magically poof the snake and uh, get the gem and go on to the next level. Now, this is a sign language verification task, not just a sign language recognition task. And we're using uh, gloves uh, for computer vision. We're also using our accelerometers again. Uh, that gives us, while vision might not give us uh, up and down, the accelerometers do. So think of them as glor uh, glorified tilt sensors. Uh, this is the scenario we have. We have the children. Uh, in this little kiosk as they're signing to the game. Now, um, you might think this seems like a relatively easy you know, computer vision tracking system. But remember, we have a lot of different uh, video going on here, a lot of different lighting conditions. Here are the, uh, the features we're using. We're using head placement, hand placement, angles, relationship to each other. We're using, uh, we're doing PCA on our database, so we have the top 20 hand shapes for the left and right hand. Uh, we're doing FFTs on the accelerometers. We actually render little eyeglasses on the children's uh, video. So as they are interacting with the system, the eyeglasses stick on them so they can stay within the view of the camera. Um, now, why this is hard, is hard? Well, it turns out we're only using 19 signs in our system, but they can be done in many different ways. For example, this is bed, and this is bed, and this is bed, and this is bed. This is cat, so is this, so is this. Most signers, if you watch our interpreter here, have a hand dominance. And so most of her signs, I'm actually looking at her, her hand to figure out which dominance she is. Uh, <laughs> but she's doing all two-handed signs. There we go. She's right-hand dominant. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so most signers have a dominance. The children we work with actually do have, don't have a dominance. They'll switch dominance in the middle of the phrase, which causes us all sorts of problems. They also have things like you know, flowers, which can go right to left or left to right, with right or left hand. Um, so that's the problem. We have a lot of, so with 19 phrases, 19 signs, we end up with, believe it or not, 128 different tokens we're looking at. There's that much variation going on. The other problem is we have lots of disfluencies. In speech recognition, uh, disfluencies, you had to actually recognize people were coughing or, <coughs> or, uh, or, ah, uh, you know, or, right? You had to recognize all those different utterances in order to make your speech recognition better. We have the same thing. We have cough, excuse me, and no, 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 you know, I, I didn't mean that. Or, hmm, what am I supposed to sign next? And we don't, and we want to be able to recognize, you know, the orange snake. Mm, oh, under the the green chair, right? So we got able to handle these disfluencies. So actually recognizing them as well. My favorite disfluency that we're recognizing is the pick your nose gesture. That's why our gloves are washable. <laughs> so. We get about 84% accuracy in trying to determine if a phrase was signed correctly or not. Interestingly enough, our sign linguist, when we were doing a Wizard of Oz study to collect data, you know, he pretended to be the computer recognizer, he only had 90% 90, 90 accuracy. So we're not that far off with the humans doing. <coughs> in truth, we're very far off. It's, this is a very hard problem. We've got many years of work left. But for this constrained situation, we're OK. And we actually deployed the system fully automatic uh, for two weeks, where we had six children use it, uh, uh, use the system uh, about uh, six hours or so, and six children who were control. And we actually saw a significant increase in their short term memory, their ability to sign, to express themselves in sign, their ability to understand sign. 
So we're very, very excited about that. This, this sign verification program, this, this copycat program, is the first example I know of of a sign recognition system actually being used for a real application in the real world. Um, now, I said, now this system that we have works for children ages 6 to 11. That's generally after the critical learning period of, of uh, language, which is 0 to 3. We also want to try to actually get um, a system for uh, children who are uh, zero, to, uh, 0 to 3 as well. So what I'm going to do is show you something called Smart Sign Alert. Um, okay, so what we have is a system where the parent throughout the day gets sign language alerts. So it's like an SMS, but each SMS is a little video that shows them a new sign like this and gives them a little quiz, which one is it? And if they don't, if they don't know, we'll tell them which one it was. That was cat. So throughout the day, we try to optimally space the lessons so that the parents learn the most in the least amount of time. And it turned out, it turns out this is really fun. We did this with Spanish for me, and I had a lot of fun learning it. And we're actually using the first 80 words you use when talking with an infant. So uh, what was exciting about this, we compared learning sign language on cell phone to learning it using a desk, the same desktop application. This thing was 40% more efficient on cell phone than desktop. I was really quite surprised about that. Now, the other thing we have is a system where <coughs> I can actually, uh, I don't know if anybody can see this, but what I can do is actually talk into the system and ask them for a sign. Thank you. Thank you. And it's pulled up the word, like I said. Click on it. I get a little video showing me the sign. Um, again. Boy. do is get to the stage where parents <coughs> can say things like, go to bed, and up comes a video, go to bed. And so the children actually learn sign in context. Now that, we're, we're trying to get that out as a Google app on the App Store, uh, Android App Store, before uh, the beginning of the summer, but we didn't, quite, we didn't quite get there. We're still working on it. Unfortunately, the student who is working on it is currently now at IBM, um, so probably won't get on there until fall. Okay. Now, I know, out t know I'm out of time. Um, last time I told you guys a little bit about trying to recognize sign, la sign language directly off of motor cortex. So let me give you an update on that. Uh, for those of you who had, didn't see that talk, if you have somebody who's locked in, somebody who's paralyzed, has ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, depending on how you know the disease, uh, they cannot move a muscle. They have no way to communicate. Can we actually have people communicate through brain waves alone? The answer is yes. We're doing forced choice pairs, things like hot versus cold, or chair versus bed. And we're actually getting relatively good accuracies on this. So for these forced choice pairs, we're getting 90% you know, uh, accuracy for real signing. Even works if you're just imagining signing. Right? If you sit there in this fMRI tube and think about uh, doing the sign, you can still get relatively decent results. And currently, we're starting to work on entire phrases. Instead of, are you hot or cold, you know, hot or cold, are you in pain or are you okay, do you want to go to your chair or to your bed, now we're trying to get full phrases like, the bed's hot, I'm in pain. So that currently involves a um, fMRI, a big machine. What I've got with me today is An fMRI sensor, or an f -near sensor. So this is basically a set of fancy uh, IR transmitters receivers that you can put on a little portion of your head. It can tell you if that little portion of your head is, activate, is active. And you can actually use this on a mobile device. So what I'm currently doing is I'm wiring this up to my wearable computer to start seeing if I can think 
to my computer in sign language and get it to do something for me. Now, granted, this is only one bit. This is actually what I call my kill bill interface because I'm putting this right, right about here, which is the wiggle my big toe. So I'm trying to make it so that, you know, if I'm trying to have, you know, okay or cancel, I wiggle my big toe and it, and it triggers this. We'll see how well it works. Um, okay. I am running over. Uh, there's lots, I have lots of other demos up here if you want. They include um, uh, a system for the, for uh, deaf folks to be able to TTY into directly the um, uh, uh, 911 center, a system for playing Dance Dance Revolution on your cell phone using sensors on your feet. That's a lot of fun. Uh, there's a system for people to learn Braille who have low vision. That's already on the iPhone. That's by uh, Brian uh, Keys, who I can uh, show that afterwards. I also have lots of other stuff, which apparently, uh, I can't. I can only go forward. I can't go back in this presentation. Um, the uh, there's lots of other cra cra crazy stuff we're working on. This has just been a survey. So if you want to talk to me about talking with dolphins, or trying to um, make better mini QWERTY keyboards and other type of stuff, please come up and talk to me afterwards. Um, and uh, the acknowledge slide just got killed off, but you saw it there earlier. I have a lot of funders, NIDR, DARPA, NSF, um, ETRI. Thank you to all of them. And thank you to, of course, this is mostly grad students' work, not mine. So thanks to all of those who are on the screen a second ago. And uh, I'll take any questions. Thank you very much. So do you think Morse code is going to make a comeback? Nah, it's too hard. <laughs> I don't even know Morse code well enough. I can do SOS. So you know that, that ring tone that goes dee 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 drives me nuts because it's mostly SOS. I <laughs> don't know why they chose that. It's just really frustrating. Uh, you talked a little bit. <laughs> there we go. Uh, you talked a little bit about what is socially appropriate and not socially appropriate. Mm -hmm. And of course, you personally have been testing out this stuff for a long time. Yep. Are there changes in that, or you know, oh, what, yeah. what are some high-level things you've Camera there? phones. Holy cow! When I first started this stuff, the idea of actually having a, a, a on-body camera, people really, really hated that. And now all of you have on-body cameras. People used to, you know, the idea of actually recording audio, you know, I don't record audio. I could. But more importantly, all of you could record audio with your cell phones easily, 24 hours a day. Even worse than that, somebody could hack your phone relatively easily and turn on your microphone without you knowing it. You can even make a phase-rated microphone out of all your cell phones. So every one of you sitting here is bugged. You know, the whole cell phone rev revolution. Back, remember back when I started, cell phones were this big. Right? They're huge. They weighed pounds. Um, so now that everybody has you know, this supercomputer in their pocket, what I do is it looks tame. <laughs> I'm just trying to control it with my brain. So you have a little display in your left eye. What is it for? What are you doing with it? Um, normally, it is for, as he loses it, this. So these are little notes <coughs> that I would normally have on my screen as I talk, but today because I'm having equipment failures, um, I actually had to pull up my wearable and actually use it for the videos. So for example, I've got to mention that Copycat is at the CVPR workshop this Friday on human communicative behavior analysis. And if you ask real nice Zahor Zafarella, who's there, uh, we'll give you a live demo of it. Um, so normally, I have notes on my talk as I'm, as I'm giving it. Uh, why do I have it on right now? It's a good question because I forgot to take it off, <laughs> is the honest truth. I, I, it's not hooked up right now, so why do I have it on? I, just used to it. So I happen to notice that um, you're wearing a Twiddler. Yes. Uh, 
And I know that in the past you've found that that was the best um, wearable input device. Mm -hmm. Is that still true, or have new things come up? And Depends on what you're doing. Um, it's still the best that I know of uh, because you can get quite fast at. I uh, burst to 130. I sustained 70 words per minute. Um, on a mini QWERTY keyboard, the BlackBerry style keyboard, you can do, believe it or not, 60 sustained. So you can do equivalent. The only problem is you need visual attention. So you can't actually sit here. Like when I, I'm a professor, I teach all the time. There's no way in my class typing their notes in their BlackBerry. Why? Because they have to do this all the time. They can't look at the blackboard. With the Twiddler, it's all touch typing, and so you can look up um, just fine. If you try to if you try to do touch typing on BlackBerry, uh, your error rate goes up to 15% per character, which is horrible. Your uh, typing rate goes down to 45 words per minute instead of 60. Um, so the Blackberries, if you can give your full attention to them, are just as fast as a Twiddler. But as soon as you try to actually do anything where you're on the go, when you're actually moving, um, the BlackBerry rates go to hell. Um, but if you're interested, we actually have a thing called On Mac Whiteout, which looks at the fact that you have fat thumbs and you hit mobile keys at the same time. Um, for those of you who are engineers, you know about key debouncing. Think about key debouncing across multiple keys. And once you have that idea, you can actually reduce the amount of errors people make on a, on a mini QWERTY keyboard by about 25% of all errors. You can reduce about 50% of just these off by one errors, probably a whole lot more. But so we can, we can improve mini QWERTY keyboards so they're better. But I don't think I've ever made the Twiddler yet. There's nothing else out there that has, has come close. The only thing I know of that might get there is something called ShapeWriter on new Samsung phones, where you actually do uh, gesture things for entire words. Um, though Schumann Zai, who's at IBM, never did a real true um, longitudinal study on it. So we really don't know where it matches, max, maxes out. Um, so the Twiddler, <laughs> the uh, Tech Gear has bought out Twiddler. So you can go to techgear.com, T-E-K-G-E-A-R. Um, I sent you, TV, a special, special invite to talk to Scott Gilliland, who's making the new Twiddler. I happen to know they got their first run of 10 samples from the factory yesterday. Okay. Um, and matter of fact, I've been using one for the past week, except for the fact that the greater than less than sign are where the Z and T are, and G sometimes becomes enter. Um, <laughs> This one's just USB, but um, I happen to know Scott has made it so it can become Bluetooth pretty easily. So if you want to get on the bandwagon and, and suggest improvements. Could, could you, could you connect us? It's, connect us, connect us it's, uh, you already have one in, in your inbox, as a matter of fact. <laughs> You're just not paying attention to my emails. I explicitly invited you to work on this. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, so Scott Gillen is the one you want to talk to. He's the one working on right now. And, you know, there's a lot of, we have a lot of games and stuff to help people get up to speed on the Twiddler. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.